My name is Barbara Moore, and I welcome you on behalf of the Divinity School and the Advisory Committee for the lectures entitled Christian Faith and the LBGT Experience. These lectures began in the late 90s and continue to this point, focusing one semester, or let's say, um, focusing one semester on a local speaker and the rest of the year on a national speaker. The committee is a collaborative effort among the following partners, Lake Avenue Baptist, Downtown Presbyterian, the Christian Community Church, Third Presbyterian Church, the Metropolitan Community Church, Covenant United Methodist, the Gay Alliance, Colgate Seminary, and Emmanuel Baptist. Uh, not all the members of the advisory committee could be here tonight, but those that are here, if you'd be kind enough to stand, I see three right there. All right. Excellent. And Stephen. I want you to know that new churches are always welcome in this uh, community to plan these lectures. One announcement, our spring lecture series will focus on criminal justice, and our speaker will be Maurice Tomlinson, an attorney who has worked for gay rights in the Caribbean for 20 years. He is in, living presently in Toronto. So I'd like to ask now uh, Stephen Price, the pastor of the Christian Community Church, to introduce our speaker. You're very generous. Thank you for that applause. <laughs> when dividing responsibilities for this evening's lecture, members of the LGBT Advisory Council discussed who would introduce Harry. Each member of the assembled group felt that we were friends of Harry's. <laughs> which says something good about you as a politician right. and as a member of this community, Harry. We followed the lead of our political leaders and decided that the, uh, that the honor of introducing Harry would be won by arm wrestling. <laughs> At least that's how we think decisions are made in Albany. Maybe not. Uh, so I had just come from the gym, so I was pumped. <laughs> so one, two, three, they fell. The others fell. <laughs> And I stood there victorious and grateful. Grateful that Barbara Moore had missed that meeting because <laughs> she would have taken me. <laughs> Harry, let me share with your friends, our friends, some biographical information uh, that many of us who know you may not remember or know yet. So Harry B. Bronson was born in a small town near Binghamton, New York, and is the 11th of 12 children. Whoa, we talk about that all night. <laughs> Harry was the first in his family to graduate from college, earning an undergraduate degree in public justice from SUNY Oswego, and then a Juris Doctor from the University of Buffalo. Throughout his career, Harry has fought for social and economic justice. He is a previous partner in the law firm of Blitman and King, where he focused on issues that affect the lives of hardworking men, women, and their families. Harry has also been a tireless advocate on behalf of LGBT communities, doing so within the legislative, legal, and nonprofit worlds. Here are just a few highlights from Harry's extens extensive career thus far. He assisted in getting domestic partnership benefits passed for City of Rochester employees, and later in passing a city ordinance barring discrimination. Harry was a member of the board of the Gay Alliance of the Genesee Valley for six years, three of them as president. As an attorney, Harry helped to form Fortunate Families, a beautiful nonprofit organization of Catholic parents sharing a message of hope and unconditional love for their LGBT children. He's also co-founder of LGBT Friends of Good Government, a political committee that assists openly gay individuals and LGBT supported candidates to be elected to governmental offices. Harry has served as a member of the Board of Rainbow Seniors of Western New York to help the community move forward on issues related to LGBT seniors. As a member of the New York State Assembly, he worked alongside many others to enact the Marriage Equality Act of New York State. Thank you very much. <laughs> he fought against proposed cuts to non-HIV LGBT health and human service agencies and state budgets. 
He fought to increase funding for homeless and runaway youth services. And one of his pending pieces of legislation is to require state agencies to gather demographic information on LGBT participants, similar to what we do for gender, race, and ethnicity. Without this legislation, many of us remain invisible. As if all this wasn't enough, Harry is also co-owner of Equal Grounds Coffee House on South Avenue and Caroline Street. <laughs> Any free coffee out here, Harry? <laughs> New York State Assembly Member Harry B. Bronson, your schedule is full to overflowing. We are grateful that you have made room to share your experiences with us this evening. So please join me in welcoming Harry as our Christian faith and LGBT speaker this evening, everyone. Thank you, Stephen, for those uh, kind words, and thank you for having me here this evening. And to the advisory committee or board, um, thank you for um, extending this invitation. And you know, I find it interesting that of all the things that Stephen mentioned, it was equal grounds that got the applause. So I will, I will let my business partner know that, that that's what's important here. Um, so I, I'm really honored to be here this evening. You know. Um, I'm not sure exactly where I'm going to go with all of this. I have some thoughts about um, talking about some of the challenges that we faced when we passed marriage equality and how the religious community was a key component to getting it passed ultimately in 2011. But I also wanted to share with you a little bit of how I perceive the religious community and not only policy decision making, but where we're at as a society right now. Um, it's interesting that oftentimes you hear the two things over the holiday dinner table that you ought not discuss are religion and politics, right? <laughs> I hope that what you get from tonight's lecture, if you get nothing else, is that what we ought to be talking about over the dining room table is religion and politics. So what I'm going to do tonight is talk a little bit about my own personal experience as being an openly gay individual, but also an openly gay politician and elected official. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how marriage equality came to being passed in the law of New York State and then ultimately the law of the land. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that through our conversation, both my um, lecture as well as the question and answer period afterwards, that we learn a bit about where we go from here and what we did right so far that has been helping us to have equality for the LGBT community. So let's put it right out there. I am not a religious scholar, okay? So you all in this room know a heck of a lot more about scripture and about um, religious theory and all those kind of things than I do. I know enough to be dangerous, however. <laughs> so what that means is, what I'm hoping is that I stimulate some conversation through the Q&A where you help me learn a little bit more about your perspective so that that can help me go forward as I work on LGBT issues and all state policy issues, indeed. So, I'm not a religious scholar, so who am I? I'm a person who, over the last year and a half, has been saying this statement over and over again. And I'm going to continue to say it until it's a reality. No matter who you are, what you look like, who you love, or where you come from, we all deserve full equality and an ability to succeed. How do we get there? How do we get there as a religious community? How do we get there in government? I think we get there through communication. I think we get there through loving each other. I think we get there from respecting each other. And importantly, I think we get there by being receptive to the idea and open to the idea that perhaps our perspective isn't all inclusive and perhaps it's wrong. That asks us to then ask more questions so that we can learn from that interaction. So if I'm not a religious scholar, who am I? I am a person who 
Um, grew up on a small farm, as Stephen mentioned, a 200-acre farm outside of Binghamton, New York, in a small town called Windsor. We are what you would probably envision hill people. Our home did not have running water when I was young. Eventually, we had gravity-fed water through a, a, a plastic tube from the spring on the top of the hill. We did not have plumbing. The heat was a potbelly stove. The upstairs was heated, the upstairs bedroom was heated by the pipe from the two stoves in the first floor going through the ceiling and then heating through just the heat coming off from the pipes in the upstairs. The reality in my young youth was that mom and dad worked 40 hour jobs and ran a farm, but found it very difficult to put food on the table for their 12 children. The reality is that that experience, although was trying and burdensome sometimes, that experience led me down a journey that I'm really happy that I had the opportunity to follow. Because that journey led me into a lifetime of work on social and economic justice. That journey, because my parents taught me a number of things. From my mom, I learned community service and the importance of family. And from my dad, I learned all about hard work and that you're only as good as your work. Those are lessons I remember from my youth. My parents, especially my mom, was a very religious person. Um, I grew up in the Baptist tradition. Um, and as a gay man, certainly in that Baptist church, I have no idea if it was American Baptist or Southern Baptist, you guys can figure that out. Um, but, but what I did know is that I was something other in that church. And I was something not deserving of God in that church. And that was a difficult situation for me, especially considering my mom was so devout. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about coming out to mom and what, what that meant and how that religion impacted her and the lesson I learned from that. So my path took me to SUNY Oswego where I studied public justice. Public justice was a uh, liberal arts discipline that studied two questions. The first question is what makes society just? And the second question is, why is it important for society to be just? And we studied that through a number of disciplines. We studied that through political science. We studied that through philosophy. We studied it through history. We studied it through economics. And we studied it through social science. Always asking the question, what makes society just? That's relevant here simply because we're talking about the LGBT community, but we could be talking about any aspect of our community and how we make it more just for them. Keeping in mind, the whole idea is that all deserve full equality with an opportunity to succeed. So growing up as a Christian, um, which I, I, I have come out, I am a Christian, by the way. Um, I do struggle with that, however. And as I struggle with being gay on a regular basis, I struggle with being a Christian on a regular basis. And that's because I get mixed messages from the Christian faith. Um, and I'm sure many of you in this room get mixed messages from the Christian faith. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so what happened for me was ultimately I struggled with two things, and the, the gay folks in the room and, and probably the family members of gay folk in the room understand this. And that is, through my religion, I learned a lesson of morality, and that is I need to be truthful. Yet how do I be truthful and then expose myself to the things that could happen to me when people know? Like when I was in Buffalo, I lived in Buffalo for a period of time. I went to law school in Buffalo and started my law practice in Buffalo. And um, walking out of a gay bar and having rocks thrown at you. Or being tackled by someone who just wanted to uh, attack a gay person that night. So to be truthful, 
to oneself, to be truthful to one's God, to be truthful to others in your sphere of your family and friends, yet to take that risk. And ultimately, I took that risk, and, and fortunately for me, my mom, I think, is the true embodiment of a Christian. So I, I'm living in Buffalo, and I, um, I'm practicing law full-time at this point, and my mom came up to visit with one of my older brothers and his wife and their two children, and they came up for the weekend, and I said to myself, I was preparing myself for weeks and weeks and weeks, I said, I am telling mom, when they come up this weekend, I'm going to tell mom. And so we go through Friday night, we have dinner, we went to a show, we go through Saturday, we go to the museum, we have dinner, we talk, we go through Sunday, same thing. Monday morning, Monday morning. I'm gonna tell mom this weekend, well, it's Monday morning and they're leaving in about a half hour and I'm gonna to go to work. So <clears throat> I say to my mom, Will you come into the bedroom for a minute? I gotta talk to you. So my mom comes in and I said, could you sit down? And she's, uh oh, this is a big one. <laughs> Seriously. And it was a big one. And I'm shaking and I start crying. And I didn't even know, you know, this this was in 1992. And I don't even know, at that point I didn't know, does mom even know what the word gay means? I, I, I had no conversation. All I knew was that homosexuals were sinful. That's what was indoctrinated into me. So ultimately, I said, because I didn't want to use the word gay, because I didn't know if she knew what gay meant, and so I said, I'm a homosexual. My mom's comment was, oh no. So immediately through my mind, I'm thinking to myself, is she saying, oh no, because she suspected and I just confirmed what her suspicions were? You know, what, what does that mean? And I didn't know that, I didn't find out that day, I found out later, and I'll share with you what that meant later. So we go back and forth, and, and I don't know about you, but in my family, my mom was, for, for the most part, my, the liaison to my dad, all right? So, <laughs> So you talk to mom and somehow dad has to get the message and then he gets to get through whatever his reaction is going to be for a period of time before he comes and talks to you. So, um, but my mom said to me, which was really interesting, um, she says, I'm not telling your father. You're telling your father. And you're not bringing anybody home until you tell your father. Um, that was a commitment I made and I never kept. I never told my father. He knew, but I never told him. And I did bring someone who I had a long-term relationship with home. Um, but So I broke that promise to my mom. So trying to make things a little bit easier for my mom, I decided, you know, we have 12 kids in the family, right? 10% of the population is supposed to be gay. So I said to my mom, <laughs> so I said to my mom, you got the gay one in front of you. There's gotta be a bisexual in there someplace. <laughs> And she looks at me and she says, that's not funny, Harry. <laughs> so, this is where the Christianity piece comes in. I, you know, my mom quickly, not quickly, but she tried to end the conversation. You know, she didn't want to keep having this discussion. And so she and my brother and his family drove back to Binghamton, we're in, in Buffalo, so you're talking about a three hour drive. And um, shortly, around three and a half hours, four hours, I get a phone call, and it's from my mom. And she says, Harry, I don't understand, and I can't tell you that I'm happy about this, but what I can tell you is that you're my son, and I will love you no matter what. To me, that's Christianity. To me, all of the scripture you want to talk about, all of the um, debates you want to have on whether homosexuality is sinful or not a sin, um, the reality is, to me, my Christian faith is about the golden rule. And my Christian faith is about doing unto others as you would want them to, to do unto you. And my Christian faith is about love. So much of this 
conversation today, I hope brings us back to that single word over and over again, love. So, so that's my personal coming out story, but you know, those of us who are gay in the room, and, and by the way, by the way, and I, I, I'm gonna say gay tonight, it's LGBTQ, if, if everybody's okay with that. I mean, I know that um, sexual orientation does not encompass uh, gender identity and expression and our trans community and our gender expansive community. But just for, for brevity, I'm gonna just say gay, if that's okay with folks. Thank you, thank you. So, so the coming out process, both for gay LGBT folks, as well as um, for their families, is a process, and it's ongoing. You know, it's kind of interesting. You come out constantly, constantly, and in different settings. And people who aren't faced with this don't quite get what that means. That means every time you're asked to come out, you have to balance your own safety and the risk and balance how forthcoming you want to be with possibly perfect strangers. Um, and which is interesting because I don't even know where that comes from. Is that com does that come from a lifetime of being told somehow um, you're different and you're, you're other than folks? Is that a internalized homophobia or transphobia? Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. But I ask that question to myself a lot. Um, because in my world, especially being a person who's in the public eye, coming out is a constant exercise. I had to come out in this election. During the primary, I had to come out all over again. Because there were allegations that I wasn't out. Um, yeah, right? All right. I know the people in this room know. And thank you for acknowledging that. But, you know, apparently everybody didn't get the memo. And so I had to come out all over again. So, um, when we talk about those risks, we also have to put it in context. Those risks can also occur in an employment setting, it can occur in a housing setting, it can occur in a banking setting. For my own situation, my own process, um, about the same time I told my mom, um, I um, was laying the foundation to tell the folks in the law firm that I was working at that time. And my mentor, um, the senior partner, all of us, all, the young associates all had senior partner mentors. Um, and my mentor, um, was a sailor and so I would go sailing with he and his wife and their two daughters oftentimes on the weekends and um, <coughs> one occasion I got into a comfortable space where I could tell him well he already knew but I could tell him and um, and that went well it was on a Sunday afternoon on Monday morning he came into my office he closed the door and he said Harry I just want to follow up on that conversation we had yesterday and um, I want you to know it's okay with me that you're gay. But if the other partners in the firm find out, there will be no place for you in this firm. Um, that's a verbatim statement. It's a statement that I also used when I debated marriage equality on the floor of the assembly. The, and at that point, Sonda hadn't passed. The Sexual Orientation Non-Discrimination Act here in New York State had not passed into law. Um, so the law firm had a perfect right to, uh, to terminate me um, for just being who I was. So these are the contexts in which um, we deal with policy decisions and I think we deal with our um, religious teachings and scripture and how we interpret the scripture language, the text, or um, where we go um, as a faith community. I'm gonna use um, 
marriage equality as the example to show the, the interfacing, if you will, the interplay between religion and that policy decision that we made here in New York State. Marriage equality was a, a long time coming here in the state. Um, actually, back in uh, the early 90s, I worked with Mario Cuomo on the beginning um, leg of the marriage equality fight. And that beginning leg was domestic partnership benefits. And the law firm that I was at here in, in Rochester, Blitman and King, at which I was a partner at, we represented state employees through a number of unions. And Governor Mario Cuomo was trying to make a decision on whether or not to extend domestic partnership benefits to um, domestic partners um, of, of state employees. And the struggle what, from, from Mario Cuomo wasn't whether or not to extend the benefits, but his um, decision was do we extend it to only same-sex couples because they don't have the right to marry, or do we extend it also to opposite-sex couples who, for whatever reason, choose not to get married? And so I, I wrote the constitutional law paper that argued, ultimately concluded, that um, it would be a violation of the New York State Constitution and the human rights law in New York State if you did not extend those benefits to both opposite-sex and same-sex couples. Um, uh, Governor Cuomo, in his wisdom, didn't follow my advice and only extended it to um, same-sex couples. Um, but that was the be that domestic partnership benefit fight that happened both at the state level was happening here in the city of Rochester was happening across the state as well as the country. Really, was the beginning of the fight for marriage equality. The interesting thing about domestic partnership benefit really was the the civil rights argument at its most basic level. And by that I mean the civil rights argument that um, everybody's entitled to the same rights. So if you extend domestic partnership benefits, you can have similar rights. Maybe not the same, but they seem the same. And that is inheritance rights possibly, although that wasn't covered in most domestic violence or domestic partnership stuff. Um, but, you know, the, the right to include someone on your health care benefits at work, the right to um, be able to um, have other work benefits like to leave time to care for a sick person and things of that nature. So that was the beginning part and, and that was the, we, we left and we launched from domestic partnership benefits to the initial argument for marriage equality. And the initial argument for marriage equality, and I can't remember the numbers, it's like 1,300 rights that you get under the state law and another 800 that you get under uh, the, the federal law. And so that would be uh, access to Social Security benefits. It would be um, automatic inheritance, inheritance if, your, if your spouse passes away, things of that nature. So our initial argument, the movement's initial argument for domestic partnership benefits, or for um, marriage quality rather, was based on domestic partnership benefits, and we argued the rights argument. We deserve the same rights as opposite sex uh, couples who get married. The problem with that is that um, it, it took us down a path of number one, being subjected to the counter argument, which wasn't really based in reality, but the counter argument that you're asking for special rights. You can't get married because men and women are the only folks who can get married to each other, not two men and not two women. Um, so you're asking for special rights. Um, not acknowledging that you're, you have no rights if we, if we didn't go down that path. And ultimately what we, what we ended up doing, and this is where religion comes into play on marriage equality. And if you remember historically how this happened in, in New York State, the assembly passed it a couple of times. I was a staff person, I was an attorney for the assembly for six years before I ran for office. And I sat um, in the back of the chambers when marriage passed the very first time in the New York State Assembly, that was in 2007. Um, and it, it passed actually with a, with a large majority, more of a majority than ultimately it passed in 2011 when it became law, and I'll tell you why that happened. But the, um, so the assembly passed it a number of times. In 2009, the Democrats took control of the New York State Senate, 
Um, we, um, at that point, I still wasn't an assembly member, but I was a staff person. The belief was Senator Wayne had um, counted enough votes to actually get it passed in um, the New York State Senate. Um, so we passed it in the assembly. It goes to the Senate. And in the Senate, on roll call votes, it goes alphabetical. And um, Senator uh, Adabo goes before Senator Alisi, who's from this area. Adabo had said he was going to vote yes. When they called his name, he said no. Um, so what happened, and you all saw the vision of Jim Alisi when he puts his, his forehead in his hand and he whispers no. Um, because he really wanted to vote yes, and I, I believe him when he tells me he really wanted to vote yes. Um, but he did not have the, the, he didn't believe he had the political support to be the Republican to put the bill over in 2009. So at that point, it all snowballed, and there were uh, other no's that were unexpected as well. So in 2009, it doesn't pass. We had the Senate Democrats in control, and, and we still didn't get it passed. So we go through 2010 and 2011 um, when it ultimately passed, but something happened in 2009 um, that is very interesting, and this is where um, you all come into play as religious folks. We changed the message. We did two things. First, we changed the message of marriage equality, and the second thing we did is we wanted to follow the method that was put in play by Harvey Milk in the 70s in advancing LGBT or LGBT uh, rights. Um, and that was to build coalitions and to get allies. So this is what ended up happening. So we went from, oh, by the way, it's just, it's just inside, inside baseball stuff. Um, there were all kinds of focus groups that led to changing that message. And those focus groups, um, one of the people who was leading those focus group at one, was a one-time pollster for um, Hillary Clinton. So uh, just some inside information. So anyway, so we, the, the focus groups were held across the country. And ultimately, it was determined that the rights argument wasn't carrying the day. What was carrying the day is love, commitment, and family. Because the reality is, I think in most religions, most religions, there's lessons and um, traditions of respecting other people and love, right? And even the conservative right who oppose because it's not a man and a woman who want to get married, you know, they have a hard time countering um, commitment and family. And so when you start talking about those things, about the desire of two adults who desire to make a commitment to each other, proclaim that commitment at a ceremony in front of their friends and their families, and do the best they can to fulfill that commitment so that they can build a family and support each other and be with each other in times that are hard and in the good times. And if they choose to have children so that they can support that. It undercut an awful lot of the arguments against marriage equality because we were speaking their language. So that was a huge change. But what we needed was this coalition to come together, this coalition to come together, very much like Harvey Milk did in the early 70s. And that was, how can we get the business community to join with us? How can we get local governments to join with us? How can we get celebrities and notables to join with us? How can we get unions and the labor movement to join with us? How can we get the religious community to join with us? So the, the, the path began to have a dialogue and have communications to see who can we get to support us. Stephen mentioned in the beginning that I'm a guy who's worked in workers' rights all my life and anti-discrimination at our firm as well. What we did nationally, not just locally, but nationally, was to reach out to labor groups to try to suggest to them that this is in the best interest of their workers. And it wasn't a hard thing to do. And the reason it wasn't a hard thing to do is if you go back to domestic partnership benefits, 
many of these unions are, and I worked with a lot of them here locally, many of these unions were already adding domestic partnership benefits in their collective bargaining negotiations. So they got it at the most basic level. What we needed, though, is for them to take the next step and to promote um, marriage equality in and of itself. So this is what it ended up with. That approach ended up with some good stuff. That stuff is, if I have it right, um, there, were, there was an organization called New Yorkers United for Marriage .org, um, which was a collaboration between the Empire State Pride Agenda, Freedom to Marry Group, the Human Rights Campaign, um, the Log Cabin Republicans, um, as well as Marriage Equality New York, which was a subset of Marriage Equality USA. So that group, through lots of advocacy, through a lot of communication, a lot of um, conversations and education and sharing, um, ultimately got, and this was presented June 2011, two, uh, over 730 clergy and lay leaders from all corners of the state publicly support marriage for same-sex couples. And they listed them all, including um, the list from Rochester, right there, two pages. The list from Rochester, I suspect some of you are on that um, page, um, those two pages. That was the religious community coming forward, and we're going to come back to that. But then there was also the unions. Um, remember I told you um, many of whom had already been involved. So this is a packet that they pulled together, again, June 2011. Um, memos and support reflect 2.5 million union members, leaders, and staffers from all sectors of labor who have written, who wrote memos in support of marriage equality. So we had the unions on board. Then we also had um, business community, many of which are um, from uh, this area. So this is just, and this isn't doesn't look thick because it's not metal. These are just listings of businesses all over the state that supported marriage equality. So we had the unions, we had businesses, we had the religious folks. And then we also had notables. So these are notables and uh, notables could be lots of people. For instance, it could be Monroe County Legislature, Harry Bronson, Democrat Minority Leader. Um, so. That's a joke. Thank you for laughing. Um, but the interesting thing is, when I was on, when I was minority leader in the uh, uh, county legislature, we did two resolutions asking for the support of marriage equality. Um, during one of those times that we asked for the resolution, we had advanced the minority of Democrats in the legislature, and I'm, I'm bringing this up to show that. Um, you know, the opposition was bipartisan. It wasn't just um, conservatives and it wasn't just Republicans. So we had 11 Democrat members um, in the legislature at that time. Um, I only could get eight of them to, to support the resolution. There's only eight names here. Three folks chose not to do it. Um, so we were still facing hurdles even within what is more, is considered the more liberal aspect. But then we also have Folks who learned, um, there, I'm going to share, there's two, there were two Republican Assembly members, um, wonderful, wonderful um, colleagues, and um, the, the one uh, person is um, Assembly member, um, God, I can't even think of her name off the top of my head, um, uh, Teresa um, Sayward. Teresa Sayward. Um, voted for marriage each time it came to the assembly floor against her, her conference's wishes um, because she had a personal story. She had a child who, who was gay. And so she got it. Um, and she knew the struggles and she, she knew that her child desired to get married. So she, she was on board right away. There's another um, Republican woman who it took her a while and she, she represents the North Country, not the most progressive area in the state. And her name is Janet Dupree. She's retiring this year, but a wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, and I'm just going to read with you her learning experience. Um, after she voted no in 2007, um, she had run for office for the first time in 2006. 
Um, she voted no in 2007 um, because when she ran for office and she was asked the question whether she supported marriage equality, um, she took the separate but equal approach and said she supported civil unions, not marriage equality, because marriage was between a man and a woman. Um, this is her letter explaining her position when she was um, up for re-election again um, and had decided that she was going to vote yes um, in 2009. I met with religious leaders and others who spoke passionately, intelligently about their beliefs. In all of those discussions, the ones who moved me most were parents who wanted nothing more than to see their gay and lesbian children share the same benefits, protections, and love with their significant others as their siblings and other married couples do. When the time came to vote on the marriage bill in 2009, I made a decision that I knew in my heart was the right thing to do. I voted yes for the bill. It is a decision that does not come easily, but I'm hopeful as the marriage debate moves forward, others can learn from my experience, search their hearts as I did, and do the right thing. Janet, as I said, is a Republican member of the Assembly, um, and she represents Clinton, Flank Franklin, and Essex County, rather conservative area, but she had the courage to vote yes, but it was because, I don't know if you caught it, it was because her conversations with people of faith that brought her to ultimately to do what she believed was the right thing. And um, so, um, the, that brings us then to what was going on um, in 2011. We had built this coalition, we had changed the message, and the reality is that the movement was getting more and more support. In fact, in April and May of 2011, there were a number of polls um, that were somewhat conflicting. One was the Marist College poll that had 53% of New Yorkers opposed marriage equality, yet the Quinnipiac um, poll had 56 supporting it, and the Siena poll had 58 supporting it. Let's talk a bit about polls. Let me digress. <laughs> so, polls are interesting creatures. Um, and, you know, most, most elected officials will tell you they don't govern or make decisions based on polls. I think that's somewhat disingenuous, but um, I think most of us use polls, at least I use polls, to give me an idea, but it's only one of many factors to consider um, when you're making a policy decision. But more importantly, um, it's one that you should be very cautious of when you're making a civil rights decision. Um, Alexis D. Tocqueville comes to mind in The Tyranny of the Majority, you know, the French guy who in the 1800s wrote a, a spectacular book. It's really thick. If you want to go to sleep, you can try to read it sometime. Um, I last read it when I was in constitutional law class, so it's been a while since I picked it up. But, but the message basically was uh, that in a true democracy, and certainly in the American democracy, um, you must be cautious of the tyranny of the majority. And so you must be cautious, especially when you're talking about civil rights, on um, relying on whether or not you have more people supporting a civil rights than opposing a civil rights. Um, so putting that in perspective, um, you know, it, it helped the movement to have some polls out there that showed a slight majority of New York residents supporting marriage equality. Um, but um, it also, um, it, it also needs to be used with, with, with caution um, because our, our civil rights are rights that ought not be uh, determined by the majority. If, if, so, if we had done that, we wouldn't have um, the civil rights of the 60s. We wouldn't have the right for women to vote and on and on and on. Um, so the, the reality was in, in 2011, we had all this support from the various sectors, uh, as I said, the Harvey Milk approach. Um, but the one sector that was put to the true test was the religious community. You know, the business community could argue, 
you know, it helps us re to recruit and retain employees. It saves us on administrative costs, and it's going to save us dollars this way and that way. We can keep more employees so we don't have to retrain and, and um, other employees and all that kind of stuff. The unions had similar arguments, right? Um, they added their um, arguments of uh, rights for workers and, and things of that nature. Local governments had the, you know, it's the right thing to do argument. But the religious community had the real test. They had the real battle. So um, Reverend Jason McGuire from this area, president of the New Yorkers Family Research Foundation, um, you know, emphasized that there was a, a traditional definition of marriage and that it was necessary because, um, interestingly, in, in his perspective, his belief, within a family there are certain, and I'm quoting, within a family there are certain duties that only men and only women can perform. Without a traditional marriage definition, the gender roles become devalued. So when we're talking, <laughs> it's a quote, what can I tell you? Um, so when we're, when we're talking about marriage equality, you know, let's not forget that gender roles and, and the position of gender um, is all mixed up in all that stuff, you know. Um, God forbid the, the, the husband should take care of the child and be a stay-at-home dad, right? I mean, that would just turn things upside down. Um, he goes on to explain that boys run to mommies when they need nurturing, when they skin their knees. And dads, he never says what dads do, but he, the quote says, this is, this is ironic, the quote says, and dads serve a different role. Okay, I'm not sure what that is. Maybe in my family, liaison? I mean, mom's liaison to dad, and then dad comes and reprimands. I don't know. Um, so, so the traditional marriage argument came up. And traditional marriage, as argued by many in the faith community, was a union between a man and a woman. Um, one person who wrote me put it this way, and I'm quoting again, um, it has to be, and this was, I received this letter May 31st, 2011, um, uh, which, by the way, was about the same time somebody put a handwritten note on the porch of my home then when I lived on Mount Vernon saying that all fags must die. So, um, you know, this, this is serious stuff. And there was a lot of hate in 2011. Some of it has subsided, thankfully. So anyway, this, this fellow who wrote me um, wanted to point out that, um, quoting Webster's new collegia um, dictionary, defines unnatural, like somehow I have to know what unnatural means, but unnatural means not being in accordance with nature or consistent with a normal course of events, not being in accordance with normal human feelings or behavior. Unnatural, something other. Remember the other, something other. Abnormal, he points out. Abnormal, deviating from the normal or average, markedly irregular. Deviant, deviating from an accepted norm. Um, so he um, then, interestingly enough, going back to Alexis D. Tocqueville, are we to let approximately 2% of the population dictate to 98% of the population their distorted belief? How about letting them have control over their civil rights a little bit? So that is um, two sources. Then we had um, the guardians of the gates. And this is where you all can educate me. Um, I can get most of us. Leviticus 18.22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus 20.13, if a man lies with a male, as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Um, I don't know, something about, maybe they were talking about um, the uh, betrayal of the Jewish religion in the Hebrew Testament, I don't know. Um, so, and he go, this, this um, flyer goes on and it quotes, and you, you guys know this stuff better than I do, Proverbs, Lots of Proverbs, what was going on then? <laughs> wow, a whole page of Proverbs. But um, uh, just remember, do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of evil. 
Um, but New York does not have the authority to change God's law. Homosexuality and lesbianism are sins. A vote for, some, for same sex marriage is a sin. Don't be a coward. Vote against same sex marriage. Obviously, I didn't follow that advice. Um, and then, you know, then we have the Christian educational voice, uh, New York State government. Um, and again, it quotes Genesis, Matthew, Corinthians that God's intention for marriage is established throughout the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, um, and that God ordained marriage as a voluntary union of one man and one woman for life. That's Romans 7. I'm not sure if that says it. I didn't go look it up. Um, the marriage is more than a contract between two persons. It is a covenant before God, Matthew 19. So scriptures were being used to suggest to us that we ought not um, allow same-sex marriage. Um, the interesting thing about that, though, and this is, so this is the lay a, slash attorney speaking. You, you all can address that stuff. I, I have some ideas, but I can't really address the scriptures and, you know, the debate on whether or not you do a literal meaning or do you do an interpretive meaning, do you put it in the context of the historical context, um, what did words mean when those words were written versus what they mean now, all, all that kind of stuff. I'm sure you've had a lot of discussions about that. Um, but the, um, but as a lay person and as an attorney, um, I couldn't get my head beyond the idea that marriage actually is a contract. It's a contract recognized by the state. Um, and it is the state's statutes and laws and the federal statutes and laws that give a benefit to that contract. What the religious community wants to do is what they want to do. There is nothing in the Marriage Equality Act that says that a Baptist minister has to marry two Catholic people. There's nothing in there that says, or we can go back to Loving versus Virginia, I'm sure you all know that Supreme Court decision where um, it was unlawful for a, a person of color to marry a white person. And um, ultimately in 1967, the Supreme Court said that law violates the Constitution of the United States. But there's nothing in the statute that says a minister has to marry a person of color or, or a white person. Um, there's nothing in the statute that dictates what the religious orders or traditions need to do. This statute was about equality in the eyes of state law and ultimately in the eyes of federal law. This statute was about extending those rights that are inherent to a marriage and a, a married couple um, the same if you got married as um, two individuals of the same gender. So what I couldn't understand is, well, all of this, even if you accept it all, even if you accept every, every scripture based on how they wanted to present it, that doesn't come into play here. Unless you're talking about the bigger picture. And that bigger picture is where are we going as a society and how, how does religion play its role in society and things of that nature. Um, but as a policy maker, um, ultimately, our decisions, my decision, was what made sense from a state policy and what was the legal analysis here. And so that brought us back to um, it is a recognized state contract. Now, as a gay man, though, that didn't go far enough. Because it's also a recognition of full equality. It's also the ability to enter into a relationship and not be treated as a second class citizen. To enter into a relationship and have the state, and by extension the citizens of the state, say they respect who I am, they respect my partnership and my marriage. 
and that somehow that step, which seems more of a semantic and a little step, is so huge. It is so huge. Because it's a recognition that you're not something other. So we fortunately, as a gay community, and with your help as a religious community, then you, I just read to you the opposition from a religious perspective. But the support from a religious perspective was all those things that I believe is the essence of Christianity. The support was love. The support was that we recognize that a person can love somebody else of the same sex. And I think there's actually some references to the in, in the Bible about two men who love each other. But um, so the 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 religious community helped us because you helped us counter those on the conservative right. Because every time they wanted to bring up marriages between a man and a woman, we talked about love, commitment, and family. Love, commitment, and family. It was hard for those who had a conscience and who really, really wanted to kind of be open to understanding. It was hard for them to counter love, commitment, and family. And I don't think we could have carried that message um, if we did not have the religious community um, at our side. So for that, I thank you very much. I'm gonna cover one last thing and then we're gonna break for some Q&A. Um, because I don't know about you, but I wanna be home so I can watch the Vice President's debate. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so during this process, many of you in the room probably don't realize, we call it the Marriage Equality Act here in New York State. It's actually two bills. And the history of how it became two bills is very relevant to tonight's discussion. So what happened was um, the governor um, submitted a program bill um, and basically just said that the state's gonna recognize the marriage. And then it had some references to religious exemptions and some cross-references to the existing religious exemptions in the anti-discrimination statutes that existed under human rights law. So I'll cross-reference them. So the Catholic Church in particular, but there were other churches of, of the Christian faith, um, came and said, no, we need more religious exemptions. This, is, this isn't enough. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna be forced to do commit marriages and blah, blah, blah. And the statute clearly indicated they didn't, but that was their argument. And what that ultimately did is it gave cover to um, a number of senators who said they would support the, I mean, some of them were local, who said they would support the bill if they had more religious exemptions. And so we clearly weren't forcing churches to do this. Um, and as well as some Democrats, what a lot of people don't know in the, the, all this coverage was, there were a lot of Democrats, both in the Senate and in the Assembly, who flipped their votes from no to yes. The coverage is all about those three Senate Republicans who did it, um, but there were a lot of others who flipped. So the governor was a genius in this negotiation. Um, he said to the Catholic Church, Look, what you're saying, we all agree. You know, those of, uh, Daniel Donald was the lead sponsor. I was one of the um, lead co-sponsors as um, the, the gay caucus was. Um, and so, so we were intimately involved in these negotiations. And what the governor did was he said to the attorneys for the Catholic diocese, come up to Albany and work with us. We agree with you. We don't want this act to force the religious orders to perform marriages. We don't want them to um, be forced to do things in their organizations that are contrary to their face. So come with us, let's talk, let's work out the language. 
So the second bill of this act is, it's, 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 it's called a chapter amendment. So what happens when, when a, a law passes or is about to pass and there's some technical changes or some changes that you want to make, um, those changes can be done in a chapter amendment. So the interesting thing on this is it was uh, June 24th um, that the Senate passed the Marriage Equality Act, the, the actual bill, but they also passed the chapter amendment. We had passed it uh, two weeks earlier, but on June 24th, we passed the amendment too. So the beauty of this thing was this. The governor said, come join us, we'll negotiate, we'll work out, we'll draft language that meet your objections. So the attorneys, they're thinking attorney, right? I, mean, I know they're in the tradition of the Catholic faith, but they were thinking attorneys. So they're sitting there and we agreed to language. They made a suggestion, we agreed to it. They made another suggestion, we agreed to it. Um, you know, there was some give and take, but for the most part, their asks were not that unreasonable. Arguably, what happened was it's section 10B of the original bill. If you ever want to look this stuff up, you can. Um, the, the two bills are, the, the Marriage Equality Act bill is Assembly 8354. The chapter amendment is Assembly Bill 8520. Basically what we did is we pulled out the religious exemption in the original bill, section 10B. We pulled that out and we substituted it with new language in the chapter amendment. And I defy anybody to go through and tell me a substantive difference in the two languages. Now they're worded differently and you know, you can make a, a loose argument. For the most part, the only change, and I have it right here in red because this is an important change. That's the only change. So the only change is this. Nothing in this act is deemed or construed to limit protections and exemptions provided in Section 3 of Article 1 of the New York State Constitution. Let's put that in context. You can't amend the Constitution through a statute, folks. So let me read that again. Nothing in this act is deemed or construed to limit protections and exemptions provided in Section 3 of Article 1 of the New York State Constitution. You can only amend the Constitution in two ways. One is to have a Constitution Convention, or two, to have two subsequent legislators vote to amend the Constitution through a resolution, not a statute, a resolution, and then have it go to a referendum in a November ballot. That's the only way you can amend the Constitution. So this language is the only new language, and it means nothing. <laughs> Nothing. The brilliance of the governor in doing this. So this is what happened. So the Catholic Church continued to oppose the bill. But Senator Mark Grisanti, Senator Roy McDonald, Senator Lisi, if I'd already flipped, um, Senator Steve Saland, and many Assembly um, Democrats and many um, Democrats on the Senate side all changed because they no, no longer could hide under the, the uh, uh, cloak of uh, religious exemption. So, that's marriage equality. Where do we go from here? Um, my good friends, Casey and Mary Ellen Lapata in the back, um, who um, are the founders of Fortunate Family, and I worked with them as an attorney as they created that, um, but I asked them to help me tonight, so I'm going to confess that I had a little help. And um, I didn't do the, what, what was the Wesleyan quadrilateral or something? <laughs> I didn't go down that path. But it, you kind of saw it in the theme, right? I mean, with the scripture and with the theory and with the science and the human um, stuff. But the one thing that, that they shared with me that I think is important is breaking the silence. I opened the discussion about my coming out experience both to my family and to an employer and, uh, and, and, and politics. Um, those who have been involved in the LGBT movement understand that visibility is a key component. But you also understand, especially for our trans um, friends, that 
without protection through law and societal protection, that coming out and being visible is a risky proposition. So how can you help in the faith community? I think you can help by um, believing and practicing and walking what I think Christianity really is, and that's love. And, you know, I think Jesus Christ exhibited it through his time on earth, and I think that um, we all could take a lesson from that when it comes to LGBT folk, and especially our, our gender expansive and trans folks, who, because we haven't passed gender yet. Um, and um, only local ordinances have, have protections and those are somewhat limited. So I, I think that that is a key component so that we can break the silence. We can help people be in a safe place so that they, on their own terms, can come out. And so I think that's an important aspect of it. So in conclusion, let me... Um, just say this. Well, actually, the, going back to the religious exemption, let us not forget the Hobby Lobby case um, and that the, the reality is the folks in the religious community who oppose marriage equality are now fighting a different battle. They lost that issue legally. They lost that issue um, before the U.S. Supreme Court. And the trend is that they continue to lose it um, in our society as a whole. So they have retracted from fighting marriage equality per se, and they're now hiding under the Hobby Lobby case. And there are cases, a whole bunch of them out there, that are challenging whether or not um, private citizens um, but who are in the area of public accommodations or public services have the right because of their religious beliefs to discriminate. The, the reality is the religious exemptions that are both in New York State law and at, at, in other states and at the federal level, um, they're limited to religious orders. It's interesting, but you know, religious orders in many respects can discriminate based on their religion. And that, I'm comfortable with that actually. What I'm not comfortable with is the Hobby Lobby decision which says that a company that's owned by the, the sole shareholder is a family. So it's a closely, closely held corporation. Um, that because of their religious beliefs, they can discriminate against their employees. Now they say they're not discriminating, but they are discriminating. The reality is, in that case, um, uh, the contraceptions and, and certain drugs, um, because of that decision, they don't have to cover those <coughs> under their health insurance policies. So, but the cases that are going through the courts right now are cases similar to that. Um, bakers who are refusing to um, bake wedding cakes for same-sex couples. Florists who are refusing to uh, provide that service. Photographers, um, and on and on and on. So, the question I would pose is under the Loving versus Virginia decision, we talked about that in 1967, they said it was against the Constitution of the U.S to have laws that prevented the marriage between a person of color and a white person. Um, it's broader than that, it's interracial marriages in general. Um, so, does that mean that if a couple who's getting married, one who's black and one who's white, comes to a florist, that somehow we would tolerate that florist denying their service? I don't think so. I don't think the vast majority of the population would believe that. And that's because we're further along in, in that civil rights movement, although we have a long ways to go. Um, but 
we're in a dangerous path right now with this religious exemption. And, and I told you how it played out in the marriage equality um, here in New York State. Um, but that is now the new sword that conservative religious folks are going to be using. And we, we have had to monitor that very closely. And, it, and it's, it's not just the public accommodation. There's many other areas that would authorize discrimination. Um, and you know, so we, we have to monitor that. And that's the role that I think all of us who are people of faith um, have, to, have to think about. So in conclusion, um, as we remember um, the tragedy at Orlando, and we remember that there's far too many um, men of color um, being shot by police, and far too many police being shot from being shot by citizens. Um, I think we need to go back to who we are as a nation, and this is broader than the LGBT community, but it's in the context of what we're facing at the presidential campaign right now. It's in the context of realizing that hate language is now being tolerated more and more. Um, it's in the context of social media being a shield against people who would perpetuate that kind of hate language. So I think we need to go back and think about who we are as a nation. And I think we have to think about our nation as a melting pot and our nation that celebrates diversity and loves diversity. And I think we need to strive to, to get back to, to that. And, and in the context of the police and people of color, I, I have said a number of times, and I'm, I'm gonna quote Martin Luther King again this evening. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So as we leave this evening, um, I think we keep that in mind. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And as Christian, I ask you to, to dedicate yourself to the message of love. To dedicate yourself to expanding that message of love to the LGBT community if you haven't already done so. And if you have done so, to, to continue to build on that and to use it at every opportunity you think is appropriate. And seek out those opportunities. Because it's that message that will move us forward in the LGBT movement. And move us forward, as I said earlier, no matter who you are, what you look like, who you love, or where you come from, we all deserve full equality and a chance to succeed. So together, we can reach the dream of that quote. And as Harvey Milk commonly stated, I'm here tonight to recruit you. Let's pass on the message of love. Thank you very much. So I talk a lot more than I had planned, but that's who I am. Um, verbose attorney. Um, but I am, we have a, a, about 15 minutes if we get out of here at 8.30, um, but I'm more than happy to take questions from the audience. If you'll, who's going to do this? You guys are going to do this? Well, we don't have a microphone. Okay. So I'm, I'm speak right speak. Um, I just want to give a point of history. You know, organizing New York State, a lot of that was, was uh, at least locally doing this thing. Uh, this would be in my state project. Mm -hmm. And so it was really kind of genius, I thought, in terms of fighting my pulpit, fighting the pulpit, yep. the religious community, you know, fighting my union, fighting the workplace. But the, the very first fight of the pulpit educational event was here. Oh, nice. In Rochester, I was part of the organizing committee, as it turned out. And we were amazed. We had like 75 religious leaders. We came for half a day, and we did a lot of talking, talking about how to articulate our faith in terms of public policy for marriage, marriage equality, and then did role play. And it was right before Easter. 
<laughs> and I remember, I remember that. But it was, it was really great. Uh, a lot of our, I have one question I wanted to ask. And that is, that kind of organizing, you know, for public policy from a religious perspective was so helpful for marriage equality. And a lot of our congregations, and mine um, included, uh, now have transgender members and people coming to our services and being a part of our community. And so we're becoming a part of our community is becoming very much aware of the discrimination that, that people are experiencing and the harm when they are when they are when they are really visible. So there's we don't we don't have that kind of organizing mechanism. What do you have? Do you, do you see anything on the horizon for that, uh, or what do we do as as a religious community to to further public policy legislation for trans? Yeah. Um, I don't see anything on the horizon, unfortunately. So um, the reality is, there is a number of us who are having conversations. As, as some of you may or may not, the Empire State Pride agenda has dissolved. Um, and so um, I'm involved in conversations with folks throughout the state to hopefully launch another type of organization like that. The, the plan was that um, many of the programmatic things that ESPA did would be shifted to other organizations, which you know, to some degree that occurred. But the reality is that void has not been filled. And, and th that's extremely unfortunate because we have so much more work to do. To, to be done. Not only gender do we need to get that passed, but um, you know, fighting for uh, runaway and homeless youth, um, the, the aging population of the LGBT community, um, making sure that we have funding that's going to organizations across the state. I mean, these are huge pockets of money in the state budget that come up every year, and um, it's we haven't face the challenge yet, but the reality is without a group, a large group of citizens who are supporting those things, it's harder and harder for um, the um, five openly gay state legislators to keep fighting for those things. So, um, so in a lot of fronts, our youth, our aging population, our trans community, and making sure that we continue to have funding, we need we need to continue to have that. What I do think you can still do, however, and as I mentioned in my conclu conclusion, is to, as religious orders, there is no problem with you all continuing to get together and, and promoting um, just causes that you think fit your religious beliefs. Next question, all the way in the back. I'd like to say, Brother Johnson, you came out in a way I never heard you come out before, I never heard you speak before in person. You said, I am a Christian. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And all the other sheep had gone astray. He had turned everyone to his own way. The Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then it goes on in 2 Timothy 2 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone in the name of the name of Christ depart from iniquity. And also this verse, Ephesians 4, 32. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. You said you were weak on the religion. I was giving you, uh, what is it, uh, uh, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may go thereby. And, uh, Start with Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and end up with Revelation 22. Uh, I'm going to ask if there is a question. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. So Amen. And I have one more thing. I forgot. Sir, we got Grace, uh, one blood. That's the only thing that matters, are you marrying in the Lord? We can't marry a chicken because of the, it's a different blood, if you can imagine such a thing. I've got to One blood, black, white, yellow, red. There's no, Anybody else no. have a question? Except in the Lord.
Honor the Lord. So we do have time for about one more question. If anyone else has one, please. I want to know why his mother said. Oh, yeah. I never got back to that. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Um, I learned the the um, that same day I, I gave my mom a book and um, which says now that you know what every homos every parent of a homosexual needs to know and um, and I don't in her lifetime she never told me that she read the book but when she passed away um, and we were going through her things. Um, I found the book on her, in her nightstand in the drawer um, with the binding totally tattered. So she clearly read that over and over again, um, which meant a lot to me. But on the oh no comment, I asked her several months later um, what that was about. And, um, you know, because I was curious, did, you know, uh, did, was I sending out vibes and did she, you know, I was affirming. Her, her suspicion and she said no not at all I was more surprised than you could possibly imagine um, but she said as soon as you said it as a parent all I thought was you were going to have a very difficult life and so her own no was dismay that her child was not going to have a journey that was going to be easy so that's what it was fortunately it's, it's been easier than many people have had Thank you very much, everybody.